Yeah, I don't think we can do it with this. I can see that person. Are you gonna host it on your computer again? Yeah, I have to. Like, as as we have these technical difficulties, it's there is no other. Do you want the um, core? Are you gonna connect it to? Don't know if I can. Yeah, I think I have only like. Do you have this? HDMI. Yeah, this. Well, it's possible that no one comes and shows up. And in that case, we don't really need another big screen. Oh, all right. It's working. Okay. And you sent out a spreadsheet that has the membership um, information of, of who is. Oh, no, no. Okay. I mean, only people who. Okay, so just let people in. Yeah, ba basically only people who registered received the invitation for this okay. Zoom talk. I really hope that all the settings are working and that microphone and speakers are working as well. If I connected it only with HDMI cable, does it mean that the audio is connected as well? I'm not sure. I don't know about that. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. It seems that audio is <laughs> loud and clear. If you won't feel free to open those biscuits. <laughs> Have you made me a co host yet? Yeah, you should have co host already. I don't know. I don't know. Here we go. Chris is already joining in. At least we can test the audio and whether it's working. Hi. Hi, Chris. hi. hi. Can you so, hear us? What? Sorry? Can you hear me? I can. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah, yeah. Right. Glad to see you. Glad to hear yes. that. Yeah. Yes, no, I could imagine. <laughs> I was just wondering, are you still tutoring also undergraduates or? At, at the moment, I'm on a, a fellowship uh, from the Levy Hume, which buys me out of teaching, which I'm slightly sad about. So I'm not, by and large, at the moment. But in a uh, year after next, I will be again. All right. When was the last time when you were tutoring undergraduates? A couple of years ago, just over two years. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, would you like to try uh, screen sharing just to make sure whether it's working? I will give it a go, yeah. Hmm. I'm not sure it is, I'm not sure it is working. Something. 
it says desktop one, but then there's no image there at all. Mm. So I don't know, it might be, it might be easier if you wouldn't mind putting it up on your screen, if you've got the PowerPoint there. Yeah, I should have it. Let me just... Sorry about this. I, I, like I said, I have had this problem before. Yeah, no worries. Uh, let me just find it for you. Thank you. Sorry, it's loading for it. No, 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 that's good. As long as it's there, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, can you can you see yeah. it now? Yeah, 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 fantastic. Could you make it full screen, Jakob? Uh, I will try. It, yes, that's the one. And And unfortunately, I'll need to ask you to to um advance it when when the time comes sorry it hasn't it hasn't got bigger for some reason is it all right like this or no it should if you press that the thing that you just pressed again it should when when the time comes it should fill the screen um so to... It's filling the screen on the big screen, but since it doesn't seem anyone's showing up in real life, I think we could probably unplug. Should I unplug it then? Yeah. Do you think that it would help? No, but I mean, then we, we won't hear it. Properly. Oh, right, okay. Sure. Well, it's, it's visible as it is. It's just... Um... It's, here, do you want to see what is coming through? Oh, so it still look. Oh, it shows... Yeah, I see it differently for, for some reason. Right, okay. <laughs> oh. no. hmm. This doesn't work. Well, like I say, hopefully it is visible to people. It's just not quite as big as it might be. Is it is it moving or is it changing? Oh, I'm not seeing a change now. I think you might be presenting the wrong um, window. Yeah, might be. I need to check that. All right. What if I start? It? Maybe it's also because we are recording this meeting that it won't let me. Uh, okay, possibly. Uh, okay, I can try. Um, sorry, I'll give it one more try. No, 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 it's mine. Yes, still nothing. No, unfortunately. But but yeah, hopefully the audience will be able to to see it. Oh yeah, now, now it's updating. So now, if you flip through it, it should it should click to the next slide. Oh, I mean. There you go. Then that's working. Oh yeah, it, it, it's at least yeah. something. Yeah. That, that's yeah. probably yeah. the. 
Yeah. As good as we get. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Chris, I wanted to ask, I think that Peter Mitchell once told me that you've done some kind of research in Czechoslovakia. Is that right? It is, it is. I, I spent 18 months in Czechoslovakia as well as doing my PhD. All right. What kind of PhD, what kind of research were you doing there? I was looking at the Iron Age and the, uh, it was my um, doctoral research and, and I was looking at the introduction of the potter's wheel in the early Iron Age in, in places like northern Bohemia and Moravia. But eventually I looked at most of Central Europe. All right. Do you remember like which exact places you've been to? Uh, yeah, well, quite a lot of places, but um, well, I was based in Prague, unsurprisingly, uh, but I also worked in a museum in a place called Bielina, which is up in the north of Bohemia, up, up towards what was then the, the East German border back in those days. All right. Yeah. But I travelled around all over the place. Yeah, I had a great time. Is, is that where you're from? I'm from Slovakia. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I went to Bratislava and, and places a fair bit. Good food. <laughs> Can you also speak some Czech or or Slovak or? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, Yeah, but I I I've since spoken Russian, so I now get all mixed up as to which <laughs> which language I'm speaking. Fair enough. <laughs> And there are similarities. Oh, well, yeah, unfortunately, in my brain, there are. Yeah. Oh, all right. It, it seems that no one else is. Uh, yeah, I have nobody else in the waiting room. I think we're all good to go. All right. Then I feel like we're good to start. So, uh, welcome everyone uh, to our fourth talk of Oxford Archaeological Society for Michaelmas term 2021. Uh, I'm very glad to see quite a few of you joining us remotely. There are not so many of us in, in person here, but it, uh, it doesn't matter at all. Uh, our today's guest speaker is Chris Gosden, professor in uh, Europe archeology span here, uh, based here at Oxford at School of Archeology. span And he's specializing in uh, archeology span of identity and today will be giving us talk uh, mostly about human interactions and perceptions of English landscape, uh, I believe from about 1500s BC to approximately 1080. So without any further delay, uh, Chris, I'm handing over to you this virtual stage. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm very, uh, very pleased to to sort of be here, as it were. It's a, it's a shame not to see you all, but uh, no, it's very nice to be able to talk. So the project that I'm going to talk about is, uh, as you can see from the screen, called English Landscapes and Identities. Um, something like a hundred million pounds is spent every year on archeology span in England. Most of it is through commercial companies, uh, people doing archaeology in advance of development. So some of those developments are very large, like Terminal 5 Heathrow, which I'll mention. Some are much smaller. Um, but the, the, over the last um, 30 years, then um, English archaeology has been revolutionized in terms of our knowledge of it because of this commercial activity. Uh, what hasn't happened to quite the same degree is an attempt to synthesize, to pull together all the information that we're getting um, from this new set of, of archaeology. So the English Landscapes and Identities Project was funded by the European Research Council, for which I'm very grateful, back when we were still members of the EU. Um, and it was an attempt to pull together um, all the digital information that existed on archaeology in England. Um, we felt, after a while, we felt slightly embarrassed that it was only England, um, not 
including also Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, but we were worried about the amount of data that we were going to um, going to get. So so um, we, we restricted our um, analyses and thoughts to England. Um, if I'd had my time over again, we would have done it slightly more broadly. If we could have the next slide, please, Jakob. Um, so it was a five year project. It started, as you can read on the screen here, hopefully in late 2011. Um, we were looking at the nature of continuity and change in the English rural landscape. And as Jakob said, the um, period that we looked at was 1500 BC. And we started then because that's more or less, more or less, the layout of the English landscape with things like field systems and settlements and so on for the first time. Prior to that, you have Neolithic and early Bronze Age landscapes, which are much more ritual in character, so Stonehenge and Avebury. Um, and, and so the landscape changes um, around 1500 BC, a bit earlier in some places, a bit later in others, um, and then takes on a character that it has to some degree ever after. We stopped in um, AD 1086, and 1086 is the date of Doomsday Book. Uh, which was the document put together by the Normans 20 years after the conquest and is the first in-depth survey of quite a lot of the English landscape, doesn't cover the northern counties as it were, as it happens, uh, quite a lot of the English landscape in a great deal of detail. So we chose those as beginning and end points. Um, we had a whole range of, of um, sources of data, so so-called historic environment records. Um, so across in the, the West, Westgate Centre in Oxford, there's the Oxfordshire Historic Environment Record, which keeps all the archaeological uh, records for Oxfordshire and all the counties and many of the large cities have an HER. So we got data, data from 89. HERs, um, also from English Heritage, as it was then called, it's now called Historic England. It's National Mapping Program, which used aerial photographs and other things um, to progressively map the English landscape. Um, a, a, a further source, which I'll talk about in a little while, um, the Portable Antiquity Scheme, the PAS, um, has over a million items, mainly of metalwork, from across England, um, and those are records of finds made by metal detectorists in the main, and has revolutionized our understanding of the artifactual history of England. And then there are various other slightly smaller data sets, but often useful. We had a series of themes, um, some of which I'll have a chance to talk about today, some of which I won't. Um, so identity, the, the how regional differences may or may not have transformed into identity, and identity, temporal patterning, how things changed over time or how they stayed the same, the structure of the landscape, morphology and the definition of space through field systems, trackways, roads, those sorts of things, and, and something that we called landscape force. Um, what we didn't want to do was take an environmentally deterministic view of the landscape um, to think that the, lands the shape of the landscape, the ruggedness, the terrain, all those sorts of things straightforwardly caused um, human action and human reaction. Uh, but at the same time, we didn't want to leave the landscape out. So we were thinking about the force that the landscape had. Um, the, the, the force it exerted on um, human society through time. We were interested in relating data sets. I'll talk a little bit about this at the beginning of the talk. Um, and we were also interested in issues of mobility, how people moved across the, the landscape by land and water. Um, if we could have the next slide, please, Jakob. Um, there was a team of people. I was the principal investigator, but I actually did the least of the work. There was a fantastic um, team of postdoctoral researchers, Anne Wynne Green, who looked at the prehistoric evidence, um, 
Anne Wynne Cooper, sorry, who looked at the prehistoric evidence, Chris Green, who was our computer whiz, um, looked at geographical information systems and databases. Many of the maps you'll see in the next few minutes are from Chris. Tyler Franconi was the Roman expert. Um, Letty Ten Harkel looked at the early medieval period. And we had Laura Morley, who was our coordinator. Miranda Creswell, who was the project artist. So in the background of this slide, you can see a piece of Miranda's art of, of um, Danebury Hillfort. And Miranda's art will come, come up a number of times in the presentation. And then there were three PhD students, Vicky Donnelly, who looked at commercial archaeology and its results um, in the so-called unpublished grey literature. Sarah Mallet pulled together information on human isotopes of bone and food, what people ate through time. And Dan Stansby was interested in relating things like pottery assemblages to food. If we could have the next slide, please. Um, so this was a, a so-called big data project. Um, we created 900, well, over 900,000 records of data. So this is one. Um, you can't really see the details, but this gives you um, in a, a, a program called FileMaker, gives you details of the archaeology, a little map. Um, big data is all the rage in many different disciplines these days. And our data, although big by archaeological standards, is pretty tiddly by um, the standards of a geneticist or a physicist. Um, but our definition of big data was a fairly straightforward one. It's the amount of data that you can't really deal with other than through computer analysis. And as I say, we got together most of the records, digital records for English archaeology. So in that sense, in, in that it was relatively complete, it was big. Uh, if we could have the next one, please. Um, we tried to move backwards and forwards between national trends, national being English-wide trends, and England's not really a nation, um, and smaller case studies. So on this map of England, you'll be able to see a series of um, areas delimited in different ways. There's a, there's a, a, a long... Um, rectangle that goes across the Pennines, for instance. Um, there's a large area up in the north of the Lake District and surrounding areas. There's Kent. Um, so what we tried to do was take a series of regional case studies across England to look at regional variability. And then you'll also be able to see within each of those, um, there was a, 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 a 10 kilometer square, a blacked out square. Um, we were interested in data quality. So one could spend five years worrying about the nature of your data and whether it's all compatible and how comparable it is and all those sorts of things. Um, but what we did was try to short cut this process by looking at a series of 10 kilometer squares within our case studies and more or less equally distributed across England. And we looked at all the data um, sources from that 10 kilometer squares and how much they overlapped, how much they contradicted each other. And we were able in some ways then to control, to compare our data in various different ways. If we could have the next one, please, Jakob. Um, we made a record of all the archaeological interventions that have occurred across England. And in this little animation, you'll be able to see popping up in different periods. So we're now in the 1840s. Um, these were um, the archaeological interventions that happened in the time designated. The yellow ones are just one, the redder ones are multiple ones. So you might be able to see up in the north, Hadrian's Wall come and go. The Stonehenge area is obviously important. The post-war period, the pace of change picks up, which we're now in. And then there was a change of legislation in 1990 now where commercial archaeology gets set up and we, and we get the amount of information uh, that we now have. So one of the things about um, archaeological data is Anwin Cooper, the prehistorian, described archaeological data as characterful. 
data have character by virtue of the people who engaged in archaeological investigation in the first place. So this map represents a changing um, a map of changing interests in, in Britain's past, how that da those data were recorded, how they were analysed, and, and what sort of completeness of picture we have. So in order to understand our data, we have to understand their character um, and work with it. If we could have the next slide, please, Jakob. And this just shows you the same thing in, in different ways. So you've got the underlying animation still going and the graph goes from, um, well, it ends up at about 2000 um, and I can't quite read it my, myself. I think it starts in the 1800s and the bar show the, uh, the amount of archeological investigation per decade. So you can see shooting up through through time. If we could have the next one, please. Um, British archaeology is often seen to be in a, a state of constant revolution. So this is a quote from Gordon Child, a book called The Prehistoric Communities of Britain, written in 1940. And he says, for two centuries, specialists have been gathering data before on England, British Isles before the Roman conquest during the last two decades, that is 1920 to 1940, the harvest has been augmented by a burst of activity, surpassing qualitatively and quantitatively all previous efforts. So that's the 1940s. If we go on to the next one, this is Colin Renfrew in 1974, who edited a book on British prehistory. And he said, in the last few years, Britain's past has changed beyond all recognition any survey written more than five or so years ago is inevitably out of date. And then the next one is a quote from Richard Bradley in 2007, which says, work is now being undertaken on an unprecedented scale and in regions where little has been attempted before. Uh, the results of so much activity have undermined received wisdom about the past. So, so things have moved fast since the 1940s and each generation has thought um, that their generation has, has really changed the map of things. And the question is, um, given the rate that archaeology is now happening, at what stage does, our, does the pattern of the past settle down? Do we now know, broadly speaking, um, what it was like to live in the Bronze Age, you know, where Bronze Age activity was was distributed and at what stage um, you know, that might happen either now or in the future. Um, I'm sorry, this is, this is going to be a slightly tricky thing where the, where the slides are a little bit small. Um, we were interested in um, how different forms of archaeological investigation were played out in different parts of the country um, and how this informs our understanding of the past. So this is a graph along the, the bottom axis of various of our case study areas. So the Avon is, ah, well done, Jacob. Yeah, yeah, now we're getting there a bit. Um, oh, we've lost, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yeah, yeah. Now that's that's getting better. Yes. Yeah, so we've got the Avon, Cornwall, Cumbria and so on along the bottom axis across to um, North, North Northamptonshire and then the various forms of shading. So the dark brown is open area excavation. Um, the lighter brown is small area excavation, keyhole excavation. The yellow is survey of various different types. Uh, the blue where it happens is field walking um, and the, the, the sort of very light blue color is other. So this just gives you a sense. So over in the Avon, there's been a lot of excavation, um, relatively speaking, um, less um, survey, um, but in some areas like um, the Isle of Wight, there's been quite a lot of field survey, the blue area, but also quite a lot of excavation and uh, large excavation and small excavation. If we could go on to the next one, please. And um, Chris Green, our, our GIS whiz, tried to, to look at all the factors that affected 
um, our knowledge of archaeology. So, so things like aerial photographs are obviously affected by land cover. So if you've got a forest or a city or something like that, you can't really see um, traces of the deeper past. Um, there is more excavation, as we'll see in a minute, going on in southeastern England than anywhere else because there's more development in that area. And what he's tried to show here in very complex fashion is um, how easy it is for archaeology to show up. Um, so places like London, it doesn't show up all that easily because the, the present city covers you know, most periods of the past. Um, and then there's a, there's a sort of a, a, a yellower orange bit across the center of the country where conditions are pretty good for the visibility of archaeology. And then up in the, the northern strip, it's less so mainly because there's a bit less investigation and, and excavation up there. We could go on to the next slide, please. Um, so this is taken from Victoria Donnelly's PhD on um, activity, uh, archaeological activity across the country. Um, as I said, there's more archaeological activity and certainly more large scale excavation in the southeast than there is anywhere else because there's more large scale um, development. So there's Terminal 5, there's now High Speed 2 carrying on, which is a bit of an archaeological disaster, but there's quite a lot of archaeology been done. And some of the larger units, so you can see up in the top right-hand corner, the, the um, legends there, Moller is Museum of London Archaeology, Oxford is Oxford Archaeology, um, T TVAS is Thames Valley Archaeology Service, Wessex is Wessex, obviously, and, and um, YAT is York Archaeological Trust. And different, different um, larger units have different areas of concentration which overlap. They all have slightly different um, methods and forms of recording. But what Vicky found was up in the north, although um, there are large scale um, units operating. There, there's also many smaller practitioners, um, one or two people working together, and they produce a series of small reports which in aggregate are extremely important for our understanding of the archaeology. So different bits of the country are being, ex uh, are being investigated in different ways, and when thinking about our results we have to to calibrate the forms of investigation and the ways that may influence our understanding of the past. We could go on to the next slide, please, Jakob. Um, we stood on the shoulders of giants. So this was a book published in 1955, mainly historical, The Making of the English Landscape by W.G. Hoskins. Um, a great book in many ways, a very grumpy book. Um, it's all about the despoilation of the English landscape. But he said um, some telling things. He was, uh, he put in an argument for continuity. He said, everything is older than, you, than we think. He said that many of the of the features of the landscape today, or, or certainly in the recent past, may come out of, of prehistory and quite deep prehistory. And he was one of the first to realize the sort of real continuities that may exist within the English landscape. We go on to the next slide. Uh, a, a, a more recent um, investigation, which is called Region and Place, um, which was a study of English rural settlements using Doomsday Book and various other things um, by two people called Roberts and Rathmore. If we um, go on to the next slide, Jakob. Um, they delimited um, a, a variety of, uh, well, a, a, a region up the centre of Britain. So their region, Roberts and Rathmore's, they had a central province, um, which is delimited in those two red lines running from the south coast um, up to the North Sea coast. And there they felt that there was a greater character of continuity from the prehistoric past through the Roman past um, and into the medieval world. Um, there have been another, <clears throat> pardon me, a number of other large scale 
projects. Um, Mike Fulford at Reading looked at um, all the records from the Roman period in the so-called Roman Rural Settlement Project. And he also defined, or his team also defined a sort of central province where there was particularly thick Roman settlement and particularly um, evident continuity through time. So we started our project with these issues of continuity and change in our minds. We go on to the next slide. Um, we were also interested in identity, how regional variability of the type recognized by uh, Roberts and Rathmull and, and, um, and Fulford et al may transform you know, may, that regional variability may tell us about identity. Um, identity is a tricky thing. Um, we defined it in slightly tongue in cheek as pr process times content. So process um, it indicates the sort of the, the, the set of uh, processes of life uh, making a living through um, farming, through producing food, um, through ritual means. And content is the sort of the structure of that, the type of pottery one uses, the forms of metal um, tools or, or weapons or, or ornaments, um, the styles of housing, those sorts of things. Um, I'll come back to identity. It wasn't an entirely successful aspect of the pro project, but um, I'll come back to it in a, a little while. So issues of continuity and change are interesting um, and tricky. So here we see a series of barrows of different ages, not far from Stonehenge. So up towards the, the top middle of the slide, just beyond that little bit of, of woodland on the left-hand side there, you can see a long, thin feature, which is a Neolithic long barrow. The, the alignment of that is followed by a series of Bronze Age barrows, um, which are uh, 1,500 years or so later, those round barrows that you can see are lined up fairly obviously on the Neolithic long barrow. Um, also, they all seem to be lined up on the roundabout in the A303. Um, now, some of, some of those alignments, so the alignment of the Bronze Age barrows on the Neolithic barrows are real, um, the alignment of the whole lot on the roundabout in the A303, we think is just coincidence. I mean, this is a slightly jokey way of making the point. Um, but, but, but just to make the point, the issues of continuity and change are tricky ones. And we can see some obvious er er elements of continuity through long time and other areas where it may be a bit more, um, a bit more um, accidental. If we could go on to the next slide, please. So we were interested, for instance, and now I'm getting into the more interpretative side of the of the project a little um, a little bit. Um, we were uh, interested in um, the influence of past items on uh, subsequent ways of life. So as other people have said. Um, things like Bronze Age round barrows, uh, which, which date from um, the second millennium BC through to the, the um, uh, sorry, the third millennium BC through to the beginning of the first, often influenced um, subsequent forms of life. So there seems to be a lot of activity in the, the late Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the Roman and the medieval period around Bronze Age barrows in a way that's not accidental. And we looked at um, uh, uh, three different case studies to see if we could see any patterning in that use of Bronze Age barrows. So in this particular set of diagrams, we're, we were interested in the relationship, and these are rendered schematically, between later Bronze Age field systems and, and earlier round barrows. And what we found was all sorts of relationships occur. So 
field systems are often lined up on earlier barrows, but sometimes they go past the side of them, as you can see down in the bottom left hand corner there, where those long lines are the boundary ditches of, of fields and the round circle is the long barrow. Um, and also various areas of that in the middle. And then over on the right hand side, uh, field systems were lined up on barrows, but they go straight through the middle of them, potentially slighting them or doing them damage in some way. If we go to the next slide, please, Jakob. Um, so we did a database of, of um, barrows and, and later activity. So this just shows you a little bit of um, Roman activity um, in schematic form in relationship to a barrow. Um, yep, so if we could have the next one. Um, and in the east of England, which was one of the, the three case studies we used for the barrow relationships, there are something like 1700 ram barrow sites in the east of England, lots and lots and lots. Um, there are 173 which have been well excavated, um, 53 records have been examined in, in detail, uh, which represents something like 87 separate barrows. If we go to the next slide, um, we'll be able to see that all sorts of um, relationships occurred. So um, this circular diagram shows you, that, yeah, again, the, the um, details are too small to make out, but shows you Roman activity around round barrows in an, oh, well done, in and around round barrows. Um, so the yellow is agricultural activity. Um, the blue, I think, is, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, transport and co roads and various things. Um, are we getting even bigger? Yes, religious is the, is the darker blue. Um, and, and if you look over on the, um, the right-hand side, um, in the marches, the area of Shropshire and so on, then there's much more varied use of round barrows by the Romans um, in the marches. Um, and um, there's quite a lot of, of, um, of whatever that is, um, marching camps and military activity and those sorts of things is the brown, I think. Um, thank you, Jakob. If we could go on to the next one. Um, so what we can say is that there is, in all periods, people are interested in round barrows, but it's quite and there, and there are regional differences between their interest, but it's quite hard to see any straightforward patterning in, in that set of interests. We were, we were, and now we pan the camera back a little bit, we were also interested in the overall representation of archaeological evidence across the country um, in different periods. So this map shows you um, the total mapping of all Bronze Age activity of all types um, and from burial monuments to fields to settlements to pottery scatters, pardon me. And what you'll broadly be able to see is that there is a division between um, the eastern half of the country, and particularly the south and east of the country, and the north and west. And that this follows through, if we can have the next slide, please. Um, into later periods, so this is the Iron Age. And if you see, um, we've imposed upon this map uh, a, a sort of purple dotted line, which is a rather rough line, which delimits um, the south and east on the one hand and the north and west on the other. And there is real continuity in the archaeological record of England from the Bronze Age through to the early medieval period. There was always more activity in the south and east, and this is even allowing for the fact that there's more archaeology done in the south and east. And also, on average, sites in the south and east are richer in artifacts, you find more artifacts on them 
than equivalent sites in the north and west. So if you dug a Roman site um, to the south and east of this line, it would have more pottery, metalwork, and so on, on average, than if you dug a Roman site to the north and west of this line. So there is some long-standing continuity here, um, which probably, and this is where it's frustrating that we didn't look at um, Wales and Scotland, this pattern probably carries on through into Wales and Scotland, lesser levels of artifacts, lesser uh, amounts of sites. There's a, a, a continuity here uh, across the two and a half thousand years of our project, and in fact, probably keeps going through until the early industrial revolution. If we could have the next slide, please, Jakob. I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, go through these relatively quickly. This is the same pattern for the early medieval period. We could have the next one. Um, and this is um, looking at um, the going back to the Roman period, um, very marked differences. Yeah, so we keep going through. Um, and this is looking at um, pottery, particularly. This is the Iron Age distribution of Iron Age pots. Uh, the next one is Bronze Age pottery. The next one is. Um, pottery supply for the early, a model for the early medieval period. And broadly speaking, one could see this same pattern. Um, and again, with the, with the Roman period. Yeah, so if we go on to the, the next. So, so we, can, we can see this long standing um, pattern of evidence, which we find hard to explain. We were also interested in um, the change in levels of material culture over time. So here, Chris Green has mapped evidence from the portable antiquity scheme, um, mainly of metals. And what you can't quite see along the bottom axis is time. So, so the graph starts on the left-hand side at 1500 BC and stops at 1000 AD. Um, and, and this maps the amount of material culture found, as I say, mainly metalwork over time. So there is a, there is a, um, a relatively low level of material culture picking up a little bit in the late Bronze Age and early Iron Age, that little bump we can see. And then about 0 BC, um, the Roman invasion was AD 43, so about then, um, the, the amount of material culture climbs exponentially and carries on through the Roman period, reaching a peak and then declining at the end of the Roman period, about 410 AD. And then in the early medieval period, there is um, less amounts of material culture compared with the Roman period, but still, and this was interesting to us because we didn't really expect it, still there's more early medieval material culture than there is for pretty well any period of the prehistoric um, era. So, so uh, what this picks out is that in terms of material culture, the Roman period was special, uh, it went a bit bananas, really. And probably if one carried this graph forward, you wouldn't get Roman levels of material culture again until you hit the early Tudor period. So the Roman period is really extraordinary in the amounts of pottery, metalwork, um, all sorts of things compared with before and after. Um, um, and we sort of suspected that, but we had no idea really before plotting this graph quite how marked the, the um, amount of material in the Roman period would be. So, so by this sort of coarse mapping and graphing, we can see geographical effects and we can also see temporal effects. Um, I'm aware that time's going past, so um, we'll move on if we could go to the next. Um, so just to give you a little bit of case study of one of our themes, you'll remember we had a whole series of themes, and this is one of the morphology, looking at the layout of the landscape. So what this shows you is a composite map of prehistoric field systems um, known from mainly from aerial photographs, but also from excavation. Um, and, and they're found across the country, the sort of blank areas are areas which are 
are less well recorded through aerial photographs. Um, and there is a mass of evidence now of the agricultural landscape from the Middle Bronze Age through, uh, well, through until the modern period. If we go on to the next slide, we were, we were interested in um, the structure of this. Um, oh, there are different histories of clearances, but I, time's running out, so I won't talk about that too much. Now, if we could go um, on to the next slide. Now, we were interested in, uh, as I said at the beginning, um, from the Middle Bronze Age onwards, the landscape is laid out with fields. Um, and we were interested in the question of what is a field? Um, a field that, that seems to be a silly question and a field to us is a, a practical thing. It's for, for growing crops or keeping animals, but, but the ways in which fields are laid out in the past leads us to question whether that was all there was to prehistoric fields. We go to the next, next slide. So here we are with Terminal 5. This was archaeology undertaken before Terminal 5 at Heathrow was built. And what you can see here is a prehistoric landscape, a late Bronze Age landscape, in this case, all laid out. So the, 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 the brown strips are banks and ditches, which are either enclose larger areas or smaller fields. And you can see there's a mass of them. Um, and the limits of this field system are set by the limits of the excavation. In fact, over much of the Thames Valley, there were probably um, by the late Bronze Age fields laid out in this way. If we go to the next slide. Um, one of the mysteries about this, oh yeah, this just gives you a schematic of a, a bank and a ditch, the sorts of things that you can see represented by those brown lines. If we go to the next one, please. Um, well, one of the puzzling things about these Bronze Age field systems is there are many more fields than there are settlements. Um, so one possibility is that um, these fields weren't just pragmatic things, that they were, they were maybe a, a, a recreation of an earlier ritual landscape, the sort of thing we know from Stonehenge and so on, in a new idiom. And what we wondered was whether, um, for instance, when someone died, whether a new field was laid out um, and old fields were abandoned. We were trying to make sense of this complex landscape in terms of the imbalance of the number of people living in it and the, the huge extent of, of fields, which seemed to be too many to be worked. And maybe these were forms in some ways of monumental landscapes. And indeed, in many of the ditches of Bronze Age field systems, there are deposits of cremated human bone, of, of metalwork, of those sorts of things. So, so we, we continued these thoughts about the sort of ritualized nature of the landscape by looking at one feature that's obvious from this slide, which is the fairly strong directional nature of these of many of these field systems. These ones are broadly sort of north-south orientated. If we go on to the next slide, please. Um, um, we looked at a variety of field systems. So you've got Dartmoor on the, the right hand side, big middle and late Bronze Age field system up on the, the top of Dartmoor. And there are excavated field systems on the, the left hand side um, around places like modern day Peterborough, where you get very um, dense settlements of or layouts of fields across the landscape. If we go to the next one, please. Um, oh yeah, keep um, yeah, keep going. Um, we were we were interested in the layout of different field systems across Britain, so across England. So up in the north, um, there are. If we go to the next slide things called cord rigs. So you may just be able to make out here tiny little ridges 
that go across the landscape where this figure is, is striding. This is a layout of a very different type to Southern England. They probably go back um, about to 2000 BC. So some of them are earlier than the earlier, the, the more Southern English field systems. Um, but again, they're laid out with a strong directional um, aspect to them. If we go on to the next field system, in, in the next slide, and in many of these areas, this is that, sorry, the previous one was the, was the Peak District. Um, this one, we're now, yeah, we can stay with this one. This one is the, is the Midlands. Um, so this is a so-called brickwork field system, as you can see in the, in the top left hand corner there, um, laid out um, broadly north, south, east, west. Um, maybe if we go two on, not the next one, but the one after. And this, we're now in the Upper Thames Valley in the late Iron Age and Roman period, up near Sirencester. Um, again, very dense um, late Iron Age and Roman field systems. And the next one will show you. Um, so we, we took a series of field systems across the country. So these yellow dots show you the field systems that we analyzed, um, where we tried to get a representative um, set of field systems. So we go to the next one. Um, and these show you, some of them are Bronze Age, the yellower ones are Bronze Age, the, Purple ones are Iron Age and Roman, and the blue ones are poorly dated, but probably prehistoric. In the next one, thanks, Jacob. Um, Chris Green took a, a, a series of field systems, digitized them using the computer, um, and uh, delimited the areas of the field systems known, but also the directions of the banks and ditches making up the field system. And this is the sort of thing that you can only do uh, at the scale that we did it in a computerized manner. So if we go to the next one, um, what Chris did was, um, so this is a, a, a field system known as Figgledean Down up on Salisbury Plain training area, the army area. And what Chris did was look at the average, or, well, the orientation of different lines of, of the field system and was able to work out predominant orientations. Um, so this one is just off north. You can see, hopefully you can see that blue line shooting off, which is the most common orientation by far. If we go to the next one, um, different field system also on Salisbury Plain, very similar or orientation. Um, the next one, please, Jacob. Um, once again, Salisbury Plain, almost identical orientation. Um, and the next one as well. Uh, we're now in Doncaster up in Yorkshire, a slightly less obvious um, predominance of orientation, but gives you some sense that across the country, um, similar orientations were, were found. And in the next slide, um, this gives you a composite. Chris did these little sort of roses of where the predominant orientations were. And, and many of them are just off north, south, um, orientation just um, east of north and west of south, which, which occurs, which concurs almost exactly um, with the rising of the sun on the shortest day and the setting of the sun on the longest day. So we think many of these field systems, probably the majority, were set out with respect to the, the rising and setting sun in the middle and end of the year. And many of these systems have been described as being terrain blind. They're laid out across the landscape in ways that makes little sense of the terrain, but makes quite a lot of sense of this solar orientation. So, so fields that appear to us to be purely pragmatic were laid out with respect to, to solar movements in very similar ways to the earlier um, monument at Stonehenge, for instance. And, and people were not only interested in um, 
the layout of the landscape. They were interested in the movement of the, of the sun, moon and stars in, in a way that was to do with the seasons and in a way that was to do with a cosmological calendar. So fields were pragmatic on the one hand, they were the basis of people's lives, but they were deeply cosmological on the other. If we go to the next slide, um, and, and we can see there is some change through time in things like elevation. Um, the, the, in the Bronze Age, field systems are slightly higher than they are in the Iron Age and Roman period. Um, but this, this orientation lasts for um, 1,500 years or more from the, the uh, sorry, almost 2,000 years from the the Middle Bronze Age period to the end of the um, Roman period in 4, 410 AD. If we go to the next slide, uh, where this all changes is in the post-Roman period. So these are medieval ridge and furrow, which are laid out in completely different ways, sometimes east-west aligned, sometimes more directly north-south aligned. So with Christianity, um, comes a, obviously a different cosmology and, and a different pragmatic laying out of the landscape. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, and the thing about the early medieval period is that everything, well, many things change. Um, and one of the big changes you find is not just in the orientations in the landscape, but the fact that um, you get villages for the first time, um, and in the centre of the village is often the village church and the graveyard. So, so you get a community of the living surrounding a community of the dead. In all periods of the prehistoric and the Roman past, the dead are spread across the landscape in quite different ways. So there's a fundamental change here um, from about 800 AD onwards, where the landscape is laid out in a very different way, and in a way that we now take for granted, completely different cosmology, completely different form of landscape. If we, um, yeah, so this just shows you some schematics of medieval villages, if we keep going, because time is passing, um, and often Medieval churches were, were positioned within older cemeteries, so villages grew up, communities of the living grew up around communities of the dead. If we go to the next one, um, and, and um, we, can, we can see that, that um, identity has a regional aspect, but it also has a deeply cosmological, ritual and religious aspect to it, that the whole nature of community changes in the early medieval period compared with, with all periods of the, of the past. So in, in some ways, if we look at the Roman period, in some ways the Roman period stands out as having this massive peak of material culture, massive form of consumerism, but in other ways it carries on the cosmological landscape of the, of the earlier prehistoric period. Um, there's lesser levels of, of um, material culture in the medieval period, but quite a break in terms of the ritual and religious landscape. If we go on to the next one, yeah, cool. Um, we did, um, just winding up now, we did quite a lot of outreach. So Miranda Green, the artist, um, um, produced a whole series of forms of art. This was a combination, this was a clock that was sold for um, charity. Um, and on the left hand side, it has one of Miranda's drawings. On the right hand side, it has one of Chris Green's analyses of field systems. Miranda did work with a range of communities, uh, dog walkers in Didcot, who know their uh, landscape extremely well, various spinal units around the country where people have an intense interest in the countryside, but um, by, by virtue of their condition, find it difficult to get into the countryside. And, and this was a very important part of the project, engaging with various different communities. Um, if we go on to the next slide, we published 
um, the, the project in two different forms. So I've only been able to give you a tiny fraction of, of the results of the project. But if, if you could stand it, there's much more detail in this book, English Landscapes and Identities. And then also there's, um, a, a, in this next slide, there's a, a collaboration between Miranda Creswell and Chris Green uh, produced an atlas, a much more visual representation. Um, so some of the maps that I've showed you are in here, um, but also a combination of Miranda's artwork and Chris's science. Um, and just at the last slide, um, we're extremely grateful to a whole range of people for providing us with, with data without which um, this project would not have been possible. So I'm sorry it was a bit rushed, but I'll leave it there. And, and I'm very happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Chris, for this talk. It's really fascinating, like how with how enormous amount of data you were working there. So I just wanted to ask, like it, it seemed that you were quite conscious of the quality of the data you were working with. Yeah. So what would you say were the greatest biases uh, you, you and your team had to like, tackle with and how you did that? Yes, I mean, there, there was, that's a really good question. There, there are sort of straight mistakes in the data. So, so people get their, their um, map coordinates wrong. Um, so, so, you know, sites that should be in, in Essex turn up in the North Sea and all of those sorts of things. I, I think the biases in the data come out of different working practices um, and different forms and types of investigation. I mean, we're spoilt here in the southeast by the amount of large scale excavation that there's been. And that in some way is a sort of gold standard. Once you've got a, a, a terminal five area of excavation, then you understand the landscape in a level of detail and a level of certainty that you can't in any other way. Much of the north of England, for instance, is better known through um, aerial photographs and smaller surveys. So there things like dates are, are less certain than if you've got excavation. But, but I think what we'd say is that there is fantastic data everywhere and, and data that if you work with its character, as it were, you understand how it was produced and why it was produced, then you can get an enormous amount out of it. So for us, in some ways, there was no such thing as, as bad data. Um, there was just different different types and shapes and sizes of data. All right, thank you. Uh, Paul Brown is asking what would be the research agenda and priorities going forward? Yes, that is a really good question. So for, for me, the priority in the future, so, so British archaeology, English archaeology is fantastic, but it is somewhat fragmented. So there's, there's university archaeology on the one hand, where we engage in teaching and, and research. Um, there's commercial archaeology, with, where people are doing incredible innovation in, in field techniques, recording. That's the sort of engine room of the empirical side of, of um, English, British archaeology. There's museums, there's you know, public groups, there's a whole range of things. But it tends to be rather fragmented. Um, and, and we don't have enough conversation, say, between the university sector and the commercial sector and places like English heritage. So one of the priorities for me over the next few years is to try and set up more collaborative research across what's come to be these divides um, to, to see if we can work together more, not just to produce the data in different ways, but to synthesize it and think about. And, it, and, it's, and, and there has been on all sides a thought that there's a, a sort of something of a class divide. People in universities think and people in commercial archaeology dig. But that's not in any way true. The people in commercial archaeology are incredibly intellectually engaged. And a lot of the, the, the best thinking about the data comes from the commercial world. So if we can get away from this 
any notion of hierarchy to, to a, a broader community of archaeology, then, then that for me is a, is a real priority. All right. Um, at the beginning, you've mentioned uh, that you were also looking at kind of landscape force. Uh, I wanted to ask, how have you like methodologically defined it, uh, this kind of landscape force? Yes, yes, yes. So, so um, in 1932, a man called Cyril Fox wrote a book called The Personality of Britain, where he defined, divided Britain into a lowland zone and a highland zone. Um, and he felt very much it was the terrain, the greater rainfall, the, the um, poorer soils up in the north um, that meant for a different way of life than down here in the south. Now, it must be said that there is some truth to that. You know, if you live, if you live up on the top of the Pennines, then life is going to be different in, in quite a few ways than you, if you live, you know, here in the, in the relatively sheltered Thames, Thames Valley. But having said that, there, there is variability across the country, which doesn't quite work in terms of his division between highland and lowland. So, so for instance, the Cheshire Plain, the area where Manchester and Liverpool and so on are today, are not highland areas, although they're within his broad highland zone. Um, but they have much lesser levels of, of material culture, uh, fewer numbers of, of sites, those sorts of things. So, so I think within that divide between the south and east on the one hand and the north and west, there is landscape playing a role, but there is also what one could broadly call culture. People are less emphasizing mass material culture large scale housing, those sorts of things in the north and west than they are in the south and east. And that may be, maybe, because the south and east are always a bit more sort of continentally orientated than the north and west. So, so the landscape is playing a role in that broad division, but there's also culture in there as well. Right, thank you. Uh, you also mentioned that there was like create a problem with analyzing that identity related to to, to landscape. Why would you say it was so? Um, um, well, I was interested in identity partly. It must be said for modern day political reasons. So, so the identity of England as opposed to Scotland and Wales is very important in the present, and the identity of different bits of England. Um, so Yorkshire would claim to have, you know, a, a, a particular identity, as would Cornwall, as would the Isle of Wight. So I was interested in whether any of those uh, differences that we can see in the present could be follow back into the past. So in some ways, what was a negative result? I think the answer to that is no, or, or certainly not the past before, I don't know when, you know, the last few hundred years. Um, certainly you can't go back to the Iron Age, I don't think, and find a Yorkshire identity. So, so, so the fact that we couldn't find these long lasting continuities in terms of the structure of life is a negative result in some ways, but, but I think is a positive result in other ways. And had we included Scotland and Wales, then I think the, the, you know, the, the north and west of England would have been much more happily placed with Scotland and Wales for much of the prehistoric period than it would with sa the south and east. So in some ways, the fact that we couldn't find long lasting identities was frustrating. On the other hand, I, I found it heartening in that it's quite hard to see any of the sort of the, the present day differences in, in identity within these islands deeply rooted in the in the, the long past. Right, yeah, I see. Yeah. The, the last question from me would be, uh, do you know of any other projects like this going on uh, somewhere, like in, in some other countries around the world? Not yet, no, we've, we've talked to colleagues in, in quite a number of other 
countries. Um, um, Holland has, has done quite a lot of work. I mean, Holland's got a fantastic archaeological record and a fantastically curated archaeological record. And people are thinking about it, partly it must be said, spurred by what we've done, but I'm not sure anybody's quite, well, I'm, I'm sure nobody's quite done it yet. Um, and I think it, yeah, it would be really important to, to do. And, and also um, it would be now important to do for both Scotland and, and Wales as well, I think. Um, the difficult thing for us was acquiring the data in the first place. Once we had the genius of Chris Green on the computer, actually manipulating the data wasn't as difficult as we thought it was going to be. So, so we learned quite a lot from that, that actually you can probably handle even more data than we, we had, as, as long as you can get it from people in the first place. Thanks. All right, are there any questions from the audience? There's one in the chat. Um, yeah, I already asked that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem that uh, right. there are any questions. So uh, thank you very much again, Chris. It was great honor to, to have you and to listen to you and, and, and your talk. Uh, yeah, we, we appreciate it very much. And hopefully uh, maybe you will give us some update on some of your future research on the topic. I'd be really, I'd be really happy to. And I was really, really very happy indeed to, to talk to you guys. So anytime, anytime. Okay, thank you very much. Have a nice rest of the day. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.